Hey, welcome to the uh, COD chapter of the AMS, uh, American Meteorological Society. We're going to be talking about the big snowstorm from last February. Uh, I'm not a big fan of snow, yes, you but I decided if you're going to have snow here in Chicago, you might as well do it right. And this storm was probably one of the most right storms ever. Uh, well forecasted and very exciting and fun, and I know a lot of you were watching it live on radar and giving reports, so it's pretty good. So today we uh, have a pr presentation by the president of the AMS, uh, Sam Augustin, and Matt Pachota. We'll be doing it. These are two of our better forecasters. Uh, Paul Merslock also worked on this from the National, well, retired from the National Weather Service, and he's also worked with the uh, WGN, but he had some family issues to attend to, so he was not able to be here today. Uh, for those of you who are my students, all I need is do you take notes on the presentation, put your name on it, and turn them in. And the rest of you, I hope you enjoy this presentation. Gentlemen. All righty. Well, uh... Thanks to all of you for coming out this evening. Uh, this is on the big 2011 Chicago blizzard. Um, we'll go over why it happened, um, some of the players involved, uh, what happened uh, throughout the event. Uh, we also compare it uh, to the 99 blizzard. Uh, and just a lot of good, uh, good stuff on this. Uh, this is an IR image, actually, just to show you the first one. A uh, big extra tropical cyclone around uh, 10 o'clock or so, uh, the evening of the storm. Big, massive dry slot, comma head. Uh, just, this was one of our favorite images uh, from this system, so we thought it would be our title page. So, uh, Yeah, you can do this one. Okay. Um, a little overview of the event uh, as it went through. It was uh, one of the most powerful winter storms in Chicago's history to affect, uh, to affect us. Uh, it started early in the afternoon on Tuesday, February 1st, and uh, ran through the morning, the late morning, on Wednesday, February 2nd. Most of the snow totals ranged from 12 inches to 24 inches on the higher end near the lake. Uh, this storm produced very intense winds ranging from 50 to 70 miles per hour. Um, both the airports, Midway and O'Hare, gusted over 58 miles per hour, which is severe thunderstorm warning criteria. Uh, blizzard conditions lasted for hours due to these strong winds and the heavy snow rates. Uh, the winds produced widespread drifting and drifts as high as 10 feet or more in areas especially out in the Fox Valley. Um, thunderstorms were also common for a few hours during the evening. Um, we had thunder, lightning, some small hail, and at that time we had our heaviest rates at about four inches per hour, which is absolutely incredible. So, Okay, a bit about why it happened. Um, you had this with two players in this. You had a northern stream wave and a southern stream wave. And uh, for order for this storm to happen, you needed both of them to phase. And uh, leading up to it, the questions were when it would phase, if it would phase and where it would phase. So you had a northern stream wave on this image, which was uh, off the GFS, about 102 hours out. So just to sum it up quickly, you had this being forecasted pretty well phase-wise. Um, you had the northern stream diving down from western Canada, British Columbia area, with uh, the southern stream uh, cyclone moved in off the west coast onto California and slowly drifted uh, out east into the Four Corners region. <clears throat> Uh, another image showing the same thing, you have northern stream wave up around Idaho, southern stream wave uh, moving from California into Nevada, into the Four Corners region. This was off the NAM, valid for uh, uh, February 1st, so the morning of, or late uh, night of Sunday, um, as they moved into the Four Corners, already starting to phase, it's just showing what a great uh, handle the models had on this one. Uh, a couple more images, um, this one was off the NAM. Uh, from the 29th, valid for 12Z uh, on the 1st, so the 6 a.m., the morning of, and then the one to the right, uh, the next run of the NAM, valid for 84 hours again, but uh, 18Z that afternoon. So you both had both northern stream waves coming down south into the Four Corners region, phasing with the southern stream wave, uh, and then which uh, began to go negative tilt and eject out uh, into the southern plains and uh, Mississippi Valley region. Um, this is uh, off the SREF, which is a short-range ensemble forecast showing the 500 millibar heights. Um, this is just a bunch of different runs from the SREF uh, showing uh, the situation that we had. You had both northern stream and uh, some of the images were completely way off, uh, like this one, more dominant northern wave, more dominant northern wave. But as you can see, most, so the, if not half of them, both had both waves 
pretty good. Uh, different placement and uh, strength, of course, but just to see, and here's the mean, northern stream wave. This is an average taken of all these for the time and southern stream wave over the Four Corners region. All right, here is a uh, regional advisory map from 4.23 p.m. on the 30th. This was uh, the Sunday before the event. And uh, the thing to note here is uh, our local county warning area in green. That's a blizzard watch. This is over 48 hours before the storm actually hit us. To have a blizzard watch issued that far in advance is just really incredible. And it shows what handle that the models had and what meteorologists had for this event. Um, the wide a aspect of this storm, we had winter storm warnings in the pink here. These are all winter storm watches, winter storm watches down here, and winter weather advisories. So this affected a very large part of the country. Do you know who issued the blizzard watch? Um, I want to say it was Beechler, because I know they interviewed him for a news station, and I think uh, Beechler was the one to issue it, and I actually remember when it came out, most of us were all surprised that they issued it, I think, five periods yeah. before the start of the event. And I remember when I went in that night with Gino at the Weather Service Sunday night, he was there trying to find something that could go wrong because it was being forecasted so well by the models and our Chicago office had such a great handle on it. They knew what could happen, so they were trying to figure out if something were to go wrong, what that could be. So. All right, and here is an 84-hour uh, NAM forecast for the uh, total snowfall amounts throughout this storm. And you can see it, it, it hit it pretty good. Uh, the purple area uh, is about 21 inches of snow or more. Um, you can see, it, again, this is pretty much the axis of the heaviest snow that actually fell during the storm. So even 84 hours out, we had a good handle on what could happen with this. Um, here's the HBC probability of four plus inches of snow. Uh, this is a day two forecast. Um, the HBC issues a day, uh, day one, two, and three, and uh, probability of four, eight, or 12 inches or more of snow. And you could see a very large area of high risk, which is at least 70% uh, chance of four or more inches of snow going all the way from Oklahoma off the Atlantic coast towards Boston and everything, a very large expansive area of heavy snow. If we go on to the 8-inch map, still same area. Chicago is bullseyed and good chunk of the region and still hitting it pretty good for, you know, two days out. And the area of a, a foot of snow or more possible in uh, northern Missouri into Illinois. Again, uh, pretty much exactly what we were expecting for the storm and pretty much what happened. So, all right, this is the 250 millibar analysis for 12Z, which is... 6 o'clock a.m. on February 1st, that Tuesday morning. What this shows, we have a, uh, a neutral trough coming out here in, uh, in the Rockies, coming out into the plains. Very strong upper air jet max of about 150 knots, uh, slicing through Texas. If we go down to 500 millibars, you could uh, start to see the second wave out here with the uh, 90 millibar jet max. 90 and knot. 90 knots. Uh, jet max and a, uh, the primary trough coming out into Texas. Uh, if we go to 700, um, here you can kind of start to see the low pressure a little bit here in the upper levels is the cold front. Uh, definitely a lot of cold air coming behind it. Uh, 50 knot jet max uh, in Texas again, 850. We will uh, start to see a lot of moisture starting to come up in the lower levels. A very strong low level jet max of about 50 knots or so. Uh, very cold air coming down behind this. Just really fueling the system. Very tight baroclinic zone here. Temperatures as cold as almost 20 below Celsius in Amarillo. While ahead of this, we have temperatures around 11 degrees above zero Celsius um, in Shreveport, Louisiana. OK, uh, now we move on to 12 hours ahead. This is a zero Z February 2nd, so uh, that Tuesday evening. Uh, big time honking trough sitting over the eastern Rockies. Uh, very strong jet max and, uh, with an area diffluence going right up through uh, uh, Ohio Valley. Uh, what we'll talk about a little later on is jet coupling with this was pretty insane. You had uh, this strong jet right here, left exit region into this one, and you had a very strong jet up here. So you had the left exit region over here with the right entrance moving up, up over Lake Superior in that area. Very serious uh, jet coupling to enhance the lift right near the upper level low. Uh, then to 500, 
you got the northern stream coming down, which is now fully phased, uh, with the southern stream as it, it's ejecting out very strong jet max uh, of around 90 knots into the southern and southeastern states. It's already going negative tilt, and it just uh, it closes off about an hour or two right after this one. It moved down to 700 millibars, starting to really uh, really take off now. Heavy snow at this point was uh, from Oklahoma down in, uh, to Missouri, right along the track of the 700 millibar low. <clears throat> Very strong jet max again. You know, something I noticed on that is it's almost like a secondary cold uh, warm front. Um, just north of Lincoln. Yeah, right here. Pretty wind that's shift. A pretty good wind shift and yeah. bear clinics are sort of like maybe a, a secondary warm yeah. front. You perhaps. go from 55 south southeasterly wind, 55 knots to around almost uh, almost easterly winds up at Davenport from the time of this. And you can move down to 850. Very strong uh, low pressure system tracking right along the low level bear clinic zone. You got temperatures at minus 15 degrees Celsius at Davenport to 5 degrees Celsius at Wilmington. So you got a near 20 degree gradient for this thing to track along and just feed on as it moves uh, northeast across the area. All right, if we go on, here's a 250 uh, millibar analysis for 12Z on the 2nd, so 6 a.m. that Wednesday morning. As our storm was finally starting to wind down, uh, you could still see here is the trough and there's the wave from our current storm. We have another one out west, very strong, um, jet max 150 knots encompassing most of the uh, Ohio Valley. Uh, if we go to 500 millibars, there's our low pretty much sitting right on top of us and over uh, southern Lake Michigan. Uh, another strong mid-level jet max of about 100 knots slicing through the Ohio Valley. Um, go to 700. Uh, here's the 700 millibar low sitting uh, closed several times over northern Indiana. Uh, cold front here, uh, very strong winds, much colder behind it, um, ahead of it. A little bit warmer and uh, the strong jet max out there again at about 70 knots through the Ohio Valley into the northeast. And 850 millibars. Uh, here is the storm very closed up just uh, around Toledo. Cold front, very cold temperatures behind it, 15, 16 below uh, Celsius around our area. Uh, just behind the front, uh, minus 10 Celsius, just ahead of the front, five above Celsius. So a very tight uh, temperature gradient with this. Uh, and a lot of moisture being drawn up from the, uh, from the Gulf and the Atlantic by this time. Uh, note the very strong wind still, you know, even 6 a.m. that uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, we still had 30 to 40 knot winds in the area at 850. Okay, and this is a water vapor loop we found of the entire event. You can see the northern stream wave coming down, uh, southern stream wave going on neutral tilt, lots of moisture feeding up into this thing. Phase taking place, going negative tilt, big time calm ahead, moisture being wrapped around. And actually, if you uh, know a lot about snowstorms, dry slots really kill off snow uh, production usually. But with this one, we had a significant dry intrusion up into our area. But you had uh, the mid-double heights tanking so fast, you had the snow take on a big time convective look, and uh, thunder snow started to break out uh, across the area for several hours uh, during the evening. Okay, this is uh, another animated loop we put together, uh, 400, 400, 250 millibar potential uh, vorticity, uh, which is the fill, and then you have uh, PVA, which is potential vorticity advection. Um, and we just put this together to show the phasing again. The phasing with this was just remarkable to us. You needed it perfectly. Uh, northern stream wave coming down, uh, southern stream wave slowly moving eastward, phasing taking place, southern stream wave kicking out into the plains, going neutral tilt and just coming up right in our direction. And then you have the 300 millibar wind streamlines. <laughs> okay, um, this is probably one of my favorite loops. You have uh, 850 millibar heights, temperatures, dew points, and winds, uh, showing the uh, tightening of the low level bear clinic zone and uh, frontogenesis really increasing and taking off. Main area low pressure developing down in uh, Texas, moving up northeast, riding right along the tight bear clinic zone. And actually ahead of this, due to the Enhanced frontogenesis, we actually had, we had periods of warm air advection type snow, uh, I think 24 hours or so before the main event actually yeah. started. Yeah, Monday night. So we'll go down to the surface now, uh, showing the mean sea level pressure and surface winds. 
Uh, area low pressure getting going down in Texas, moving northeast and starting to occlude as it's uh, near Terre Haute and Lafayette, which is a near perfect uh, service low track for us to get heavy snow. And uh, the reason why we had such strong winds is we had a very intense pressure gradient with the high pressure sitting up over the northern plains uh, near 1044 and to our uh, to 996 service low. You got a 50 millibar gradient, uh, which is creating very strong winds in our area. All right, here is a uh, map of just front, uh, some frontogenesis, which is the development of a front. Uh, this is at 850 millibars, uh, 6Z on the first. And pretty much we put this on here just to show you the point of how strong this thing was starting to develop. All of these lines show, uh, or the more lines that you have show stronger frontogenesis. So uh, at this time, very strong frontogenesis, also a very tight temperature gradient. Um, go from negative 16 in the northern panhandle of Texas to about 20 degrees above um, zero Celsius in uh, southern Texas and eastern parts of Mexico. So very strong um, temperature gradient, fueling uh, strong frontogenesis at this time. Um, here's a uh, MD that was issued. This is just the beginning of the storm. Uh, this surface low pressure, or the 850 low pressure, right? Yeah, 850 low. Uh, starting to develop Pacific cold front. Arctic cold front north of it. This is where we started to get the precip to uh, break out. Very strong low level jet, um, bringing in lots of moisture. And this is where you started to get some wintry precipitation, some sleet freezing rain, which eventually changed all over to snow, um, as you will see in upcoming slides. OK, uh, this was a uh, mesoscale discussion 64, which is issued at uh, 3.30 in the morning. Uh, the deformation zone of the uh, snow is really starting to take off. Oklahoma City during the early morning hours, uh, which is in central Oklahoma, went down to an eighth of a mile of visibility uh, in heavy, heavy snow, uh, which you don't see a lot at all. And this is just the start of the heavy snow band, which you can see is aimed right up into western Illinois during the later part of the day. And uh, move on to the next MD issued, which at 1036. You got very heavy snow now all the way from uh, extreme western Illinois down through central Missouri. You got four stars, which is a symbol of heavy snow, all the way from northeast Oklahoma on northeastward. Uh, snowfall rates expected of two to three inches per hour. I was actually sitting in a lab uh, during this, and I knew when this came out, it was just the fun was about to begin. So <laughs> this was an exciting one. All right, and we go on to this one, and this is one of our favorite images ever um, for, for winter for a winter weather event. This is just perfect for us. We have uh, the 850 low here near St. Louis. We have a very strong ascending warm conveyor belt, so a low level jet at 850 millibars, 70 to 80 knots, which is just absolutely insane, coming right into the area, wrapping around this into the cold air. Uh, this area in black from uh, southern Lake Michigan, northeastern Illinois, back down through Missouri, um, indicates rates of one to, or two to three inch per hour snows and sometimes even heavier snow at that point. And just this whole area, the whole area in pink, the whole region, heavy snow, blizzard conditions through the afternoon and evening. And again, this was just the beginning of the fun. Okay, so this was an MD issued for us at 336 uh, that Tuesday afternoon. And uh, just to kind of sum this up for you, uh, snowfall rates starting off the storm about one to two inches, which is you know crazy to start off the storm that uh, that quickly on the snow rates. Usually about one inch per hour rates is pretty pretty decently heavy snow at that point. So one to two inch per hour snow rates spreading across the area. Uh, they'll increase to two to three inches per hour as the evening goes on. Uh, and this wasn't a small area, affected a 120 mile wide corridor uh, centered al along a line from Quincy to Chicago. Uh, and then this, in, in that area, enhanced mesoscale banding was expected, which uh, started uh, the production of thunderstorms. Uh, let's see, 700 to 500 millibar lapse rates steepened, uh, which helped mesoscale banding to be enhanced between Chicago and the Wisconsin border during the evening hours and also a very tight pressure gradient, uh, which produced very strong winds. And again, at this time, only at or above 35 miles per hour. This is right at the beginning of the storm. They obviously got much stronger than that throughout the storm. OK, uh, this is a map I threw together pretty quickly as uh, just as we started doing this uh, talk. <clears throat> I drew a service low, which is uh, located in uh, southeast Missouri, right on the Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri border at 21Z, so 3 o'clock in the afternoon down to 996 millibars. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, warm front stretching uh, north northeastward. You got 52 degrees at Paducah, and you go quickly west. It drops up into the upper 20s. So a very str uh, strong gradient right there. Already a large expansion of snow. Uh, a lot of observations already reporting moderate to heavy snow at this time. This is just when it's starting to get going at three o'clock. All right, here is a map of uh, pressure tendencies. All of these lines are how fast the, uh, fast the pressure is falling uh, per three hours. So this pretty much indicates when you have a lot of these lines together, there's intense cyclogenesis occurring. Uh, here in uh, east central Illinois, we have about uh, seven millibar per three hour drops, which is very intense. And behind it, we have about eight, mil, uh, eight millibar per three hour rises. So uh, at this time, we had very intense cyclogenesis going on. Um, just, just judging by the uh, temperature drops, and here are the vectors also, so you can see the winds just howling off the lake at that time for us. Okay, uh, the thunder snow I expect, which I got none out of, and many of you probably got <laughs> lightning and thunder, but I didn't see any of it, so only negative of this storm. But uh, this was from uh, LOTS afternoon AFD, or afternoon area forecast discussion uh, from the 31st. Uh, substantial omega lift into this layer with uh, 200 to 500 uh, joules per kilogram of elevated cape uh, could easily translate into snowfall rates between 2 and 3 inches per hour for a period of time uh, if enough instability can be generated. Uh, so you had thunder snow possible which could further enhance snowfall rates and uh, from I've been reading AFDs for years now and to see the lot or Chicago office mentioned 4 inch per hour rates that was a first for us to see so we were pretty excited about that one. All right, and here is a map of the uh, local area. These are all lightning strikes, and this is just during about an hour or two during the evening, during the height of the event. Uh, and you can see how most of them were clustered uh, in the southwest suburbs around Ottawa and Morris, uh, some more out further in the Fox Valley. We have a couple around Midway Airport, one around O'Hare, a couple downtown. So that's how all the uh, major reporting stations we got uh, thunder snow, one right by the uh, National Weather Service down in Romeoville. And, there's your little void <laughs> right over uh, Matt's house. But, uh, <laughs> yep. All right, this was a 700 millibar up, upward vertical velocity uh, forecast off the GFS for uh, 54 hours out, valid for uh, 6Z on the second, so overnight hours. Uh, this is area of enhanced or maxed out lift. These values were completely maxed out, so we were going giddy over these even days before it got here. Uh, we were using this to pinpoint where the exact uh, heavy snow track would be and also where the best chance for thunder snow uh, was located. So you have your 700 millibar low uh, crossing right over St. Louis with your very heavy snow axis up into uh, Illinois, into southern Michigan. All right, here's a little surface map I uh, drew up. This is from uh, 10 p.m. Um, on that Tuesday, just about the, the height of the storm. It uh, just pretty much just shows here the uh, surface low pressure in uh, southeast Illinois down to 996 millibars. Uh, the, the storm's already starting to occlude at this point, as, uh, as you can see here. The warm front, uh, very strong warm front, 51, just south of the warm front to 34, just north of it. And uh, you can see a lot of the obs around us. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but either heavy snow. Uh, at this time, O'Hare was reporting 20 degrees with uh, thunder snow. Some thunder snow down in Peoria too. All very strong winds sustained 25 to 35 uh, at this time and most of these stations reporting moderate if not heavy snow. Okay, another uh, map that Sam put together for the same time frame. You have a big expansion of light snowfall all the way from eastern central Kansas uh, down through southern Missouri extreme uh, Arkansas going all the way up into uh, western and upstate New York. A uh, smaller area of uh, moderate snow being reported at this time, and then you get smaller with a heavy, heavy axis of snow all the way uh, from Peoria up to Madison, Milwaukee, and over to Grand Rapids. And then usually just north of the dry slot, which was uh, already through us at this time, but due to the mid-level heights falling rapidly, you have convective snow breaking out in this uh, southwest northeast corridor from Peoria all the way up through uh, O'Hare and the Loop. All right, and here is a map of the whole country, the, uh, how expansive this storm was. These are all the watches and warnings and advisories for this. All this red area from Oklahoma City up to Chicago and Milwaukee, that's all a blizzard warning, which is just a crazy area to have that much of a, 
uh, the country covered in uh, just blizzard warnings. All the pink from New Mexico, all the way through the plains, through the northeast, all the way to Boston. Those are all winter storm warnings. Um, behind it, all the wind chill advisories and wind chill warnings and everything for the cold that uh, we had after it. Uh, all of these uh, winter storm warnings from uh, New Mexico to the east coast runs about 2,200 miles and about 24 states, so about half the country uh, statewide was at least under a winter storm warning at this time. So. Okay, uh, back to uh, the jet coupling, which we found quite amazing with this. You can see a very strong jet associated with a southern wave. You've got 160 knots pushing northeastward, left exit region of this jet, and then entering the right entrance region of uh, the northern jet. So you have very strong enhanced lift in this region, uh, right where the 500 millibar uh, low was located at this time. This was off the NAM forecast, close to the event, uh, valid for 21Z, so 3 o'clock at this time. Do this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, the other image we thought we'd show was uh, just how much uh, theta E uh, in the low levels was being fed into the low level circulation of this thing. But lots of moisture being fed up by a very strong low level jet, 60 knots right into the circulation, producing tons of moisture right up and over the front back into the cold air, which was your cause of the heavy snow at the time. Uh, another map we thought we'd throw up here was uh, off the GFS uh, showing the warm conveyor belt. Or the WCB. This is a five standard deviation uh, forecast which popped in this time, just showing how rare of a low level jet this was for this time of the year and associated with this storm. All right, and we did some comparisons between the blizzard this year and the blizzard of 1999 on about January 1st and 2nd. Uh, both of the events had a distinct northern and southern stream, or had distinct northern and southern stream waves. Um, the area of low pressure at the surface for both were nearly identical in location for a time. Uh, both waves phased, but for the 1999 event they phased a little bit further east. And we'll show you some, uh, some of these similarities and dif differences in map form uh, after this. Um, differences in what wave became dominant. Uh, tilt of the trough, trough in both cases uh, played a role in the speed of the system. And uh, the 2011 storm this year occluded much faster. Okay, uh, first uh, two maps we'll show you. The left images is the blizzard we had this past February. Right images are the 99 blizzard. Uh, this is off the GFS, forecasted for Monday morning, 12Z. Um, both showing both waves, northern stream and uh, southern stream waves. And then this is for the 99 blizzard, which uh, 500 millibar analysis for that Friday morning, uh, January 1st. Both had northern stream and a southern stream wave. So you have pretty good similarity between those right there at that point. Then you move 24 hours ahead, and now you start seeing some differences. You've got 500 millibar analysis to the left uh, for 12Z Tuesday morning out of the first. You got the southern stream wave taking over, uh, going ne negatively tilted over Texas with a uh, northern stream wave uh, continuing to dive south in phase. But the difference between this one and this one is you had the phasing occur and you had the northern stream wave uh, become dominant. And you also had a more neutral tilt, which slowed this system down quite a bit, as you'll see, as in this one, just ejected out and really started to increase its speed. Uh, and then you're looking uh, at the service locations, almost identical. They're both sitting. Well, this is uh, valid for 0Z Wednesday. And then this was for uh, that Sunday on the 3rd, both sitting over uh, northern Memphis, north area of Memphis, uh, near Paducah at the same time. And that's pretty much a favored track for heavy snow in this area, usually up through Memphis and up to Indianapolis and Michigan. So we'll move on now. And then just 12 hours later, uh, we have our service low from February already starting to occlude uh, in Indiana, where this one uh, didn't occlude until 24 hours later up in uh, Michigan. So due to the tilt of this one, it, uh, took, it moved a lot slower and uh, uh, didn't occlude until 24 hours later, while this one occluded much faster. All right, here are some of the uh, top wind gusts from this storm. And uh, again, this is one of the most unique things from this, uh, that we had uh, just such strong winds. A couple of the highest wind gusts, Chicago Lakefront at 70 miles an hour, Burns Harbor, Waukegan Harbor in the 60s, with the winds coming off the frictionless lake, or less friction at least. Um, you know, we had the stronger wind gusts there. Um, Chicago O'Hare officially, uh, 61 mile an hour top wind gust. 
midway at uh, 58, and anything above 58 is severe thunderstorm warning criteria wind. So to have severe warning wind in a snowstorm was really unprecedented. And um, to note that all of these are above 50 miles an hour. Blizzard criteria is 35 miles per hour for three hours. This, uh, all the wind gusts are well above that. So we weren't just borderlining blizzard criteria, we were well into the range. Okay, why was it so windy? Uh, this is a sounding uh, off the GFS, valid for uh, 6Z Wednesday, so the overnight hours for O'Hare off the Twister Data website, uh, showing a nice dry adiabatic layer in the low levels uh, with uh, impressive nine, uh, 900 millibar winds or near 950 millibar winds of uh, 65 knots able to mix down. You also had a very strong uh, cold conveyor belt to thank for this as well. And uh, just another image showing pretty much the same thing, dry adiabatic layer in the low levels to mix down, very strong uh, northeasterly winds coming right off the lake. Uh, and here's uh, another little uh, analysis I did. This was for uh, 6 p.m. Uh, that Tuesday evening. Uh, this is pretty much what me and Matt was saying, but in map form here, 925 winds uh, contoured. And you can see just north of the surface low, 60 knot winds uh, just above the surface. Uh, it's very strong, a wide area of 50 knot winds from Kansas City to uh, the uh, Quad Cities, uh, including the Chicago area. So these gusts were easily mixed down to the surface, obviously, and uh, in any thunderstorms and convection, those were uh, mixed down, and that's where we had some of our strongest wind gusts. <clears throat> okay, this was uh, taken off buff kit uh, for O'Hare off the NAM, uh, I think, a couple days before the event, just to show how well it was forecasted. Uh, this was valid for 2 a.m. Uh, Wednesday morning, showing a very impressive uh, dendritic growth zone, or GGZ, which we us geeks like to call it, which is usually uh, between 10 and uh, minus 10 and minus 20 degrees Celsius, or if you want to get nitpicky, minus 12 to minus 18 degrees Celsius. But uh, for this one, you had in the thermal profile, you had temps, temperatures starting out at minus 10 around 900 millibars and staying in that area all the way up to 550 millibars. So you had 350 millibar layer of perfect snow growth region to get those big fluffy dendrites to accumulate quickly. All right, and here are some of the highest snowfall totals across the area. Uh, Highland, Indiana, 23.9 inches, probably had uh, some lake enhancement uh, to affect that. And, Again, it's just amazing to see how many stations reported over 20 inches of snow uh, for this system. And, you know, not just near the lake, you know, Lake Enhancement did have some uh, a small part of it. But again, a lot of these are just from, uh, just from the storm itself, about 20.9 at Midway um, and 20 at O'Hare for the event. Okay, this was uh, taken off the lot radar, the Romeoville site, at 6.30 in the morning the next day, so Wednesday morning. Uh, main area of snow associated with the system is pushing off to the east. You're starting to get a lake component now coming uh, down into northeast Illinois with a very strong lake effect snow band uh, pushing all the way down to near Morris, all the way up from uh, Milwaukee area. And I actually happened to wake up at this time randomly after I went to bed thunder snowless and uh, woke up and picked up an inch and a half in under an hour. So you had this last lake effect snow band pushing through the area, producing still very heavy snow rates. Uh, right when the sun was about to come up. Uh, and here's a graphic view of uh, the snow totals. Heaviest, um, all, pretty much all this red area is over 20 <clears throat> inches. Orange area is the highest. This did have to do with some of the lake effect and lake enhancement um, that was involved the morning before that uh, Monday night and Tuesday morning up around Kenosha and Racine. But again, a good chunk of the areas, again, especially along the lake, northwest Indiana with over 20 inches. Uh, you know, amounts tapered off, but still, you know, a foot or more of snow. So tapered, still, you still got a lot of snow from it. So, um, all right. Here is a time lapse. This is one of the most interesting time lapses I found um, throughout the entire event. Let's take a watch. No sound. <laughs> Talk about the end of it. Right. And then at the end, you'll be able to see when the snow stops and the lake effect kicked in, you can actually see the size of the dentrites are larger 
and, uh, and uh, yeah, it's right towards the end of the storm. Right when the sun so, comes up, you can see the lake effect yeah. kick in at the bottom of the screen. Right Just quick. There. Right there. And there was the little lake effect band that moved through. So. And then uh, this was uh, Chicago's top snowstorms. It's now ranked uh, third on the list, coming in at 20.2 inches. And uh, just to note, that's some stats that we found. This, some of them are over several days. So you got number seven in uh, 1929, which is from the December 17th to the 20th. So you only got 15 inches over three days, where in some of these, you got uh, 20, 20 to 23 inches in a day or a day and a half. And another thing, we had, we've had two snowstorms now greater than 20 inches only in a 12 year period. So we're not to 23 yet, but hopefully it's pretty soon. <laughs> All right, and here's just a little before and after, or you know, the first snowstorm that we had like this, blizzard of 67, Lakeshore Drive, and then this year, Lakeshore Drive. And uh, you can see almost the same thing happened. Uh, so you wouldn't think it would still happen nowadays, but yeah, it, it, it does, apparently. And then if you haven't seen this, this is uh, Mr. Thundersnow or Jim Cantore, who seems to be a Thundersnow magnet the last few years. Smoke! <laughs> Just incredible! <laughs> Robbie! <laughs> Twice in one storm, baby! <laughs> and Matt is crying on the inside yeah. right now. <laughs> and he already got it this year in Harrisburg in October. Yeah. All right, and then uh, these last few images are some of our favorites that we went through and found. Uh, this was off the NAM, one of the more amped runs. Uh, you had a small area of uh, near an inch and a quarter total QPF in just a six hour period. So to see that is pretty insane in its own. Uh, service low, a little weaker than what verified, but you had a thousand millibar service low on this. Very uh, tight and strong, low level bear clinic zone just to the northeast of the service low. And then uh, you go 12 hours ahead. Uh, deformation band with the same small contour of a uh, lot of a lot of precip in a very little amount of time. So pretty impressive. And uh, here's the uh, Shreff mean forecast: 12 hours snow uh, totals. And uh, you know, again, just seeing this, we're totally bullseye northern Illinois, maxed out 15 plus inches forecasted. So, uh, so yeah, just again, uh, amazing to see how many uh, forecast models and everything their products were maxed out for this event. And this was one of them. Uh, this was off the LSX Wharf, which is run out of St. Louis office. Uh, total precip, this was actually uh, ran that Monday evening, 0 run after we got out of mezzo class. This uh, actually increased from the 12 z run prior. You had uh, near almost two inches of QPF coming out all the way from southwest Missouri up through uh, the greater Chicagoland area in this time frame. And uh, this is probably both of our uh, favorite picture here. Uh, this is uh, what the RPM model forecasted. This was from Sunday morning. And uh, yeah, 38.3 inches, uh, you know, forecasted and everything. And I woke up with this picture uh, uh, texted from uh, Matt here, and I woke up and I couldn't believe it, you know. Uh, obviously, this came nowhere close to verifying. We were almost 20 inches short of this. But it just seeing you know those amounts being forecast and to see what was actually possible with the storm was absolutely amazing. But this is one I, one map I won't forget. Um, yeah. Yes, in a sense they are, but um, some of the buff kit numbers actually were being run, and depending what snow ratios were being put into them with the amount of total QPF uh, that we were seeing, you were still getting. Uh, amounts up near the low 30 inch mark, even though we knew that that was too high. But due to the snow ratios being put into the model, they were spitting out even numbers close to this. But no one, just to forecast, I mean, we got 20 inches and it's tough to forecast a one in 50 year event or so like that. So just to see these was pretty amazing in its own. Go. 
we really uh, took a measurement of snow depth. We didn't really take all yeah. the measurements uh, because that snow was just blowing away. Yeah. Is you? The first, first two hours <clears throat> that we had snowfall coming down, my boards were quite clean. Uh -huh. You were in Oak Brook, right? Right. Okay. And I called O'Hare, and there was a part of the river over there. Thank you. And uh, he said the same thing. He said his boards are absolutely clean too. And we had an hour and a half of snow. Huh. What did you finally get total wise? 22. Did you take that over an average of different locations or just two? two? That was the only way. Okay. And we couldn't even go back with the old theory of looking at a water equivalent because mm -hmm. the cylinders didn't even have anything in there for yeah. a long time. And speaking of equivalent or snow ratio wise, the only negative that really was with this storm is you had the great dendritic growth zone and depth for snow production and large, uh, large snowflakes, but the negative that we thought was the case was you had the very strong winds and the low levels that could rip apart uh, the higher or the, the fluffier dendrites to cut down on accumulations a bit. So we think we might have a few more inches of snow, maybe close to the record if the winds and the low levels were a little weaker. So just something to think about. What was the final uh, snow to rain? Uh, I think I saw maybe 13 to 1 or something like that. Yeah. And for temperatures in the lower 20s yeah. throughout the entire event, you'd expect a little higher ratios, yeah. but with the wind, yeah. So. Well, that's it for our talk, but if anyone has any questions, feel yep. free to ask. All right. And, uh, Thank you, Christy Tomzak, for helping Thanks, us out with that. And uh, shout out to my dad. Uh, it's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Dad. So, um, Hi, Mom. <laughs> so, um, yeah, all right. Their answer, yeah. go ahead. Yep. Question real quick. Um, especially in the beginning of the talk, you talked a lot about the phasing of the waves. Could you give a brief description of what that means? Well, with this situation, you had both storms phasing and I guess if that wave came out on its own without the northern stream, I guess it could have been a little weaker, I guess in an easy sense of saying it, you had a little more energy to work with with that northern stream wave coming down and interacting with the southern stream wave and just phasing completely and then kicking out and just giving it a little more boost. And same thing with the 99 blizzard, I mean if you just had that one single wave, you had the big blocking region up in the northeast and the northeast and southern part of the Canada. So if that if you had that try to kick out on its own, it might struggle. But I think with that extra help with the northern stream wave, you're going to get bigger storms each time of the phase. And that just uh, talking about phase wise, we have a possibility of that next week or early week. So something to watch. The the waves themselves, as I recall, because you you had the the deep long wave trough that really ejected the short wave. Yeah. But there was a secondary vort max that at least early on had been progged to kind of create another mm -hmm. snow bout, which I don't think it ever no. transpired. Early on, no. It was but just do you remember, I, that yeah. my, I don't know if that's part of the 35 inches forecast of the RPM. but Right, that, that's possible because that, was, that came out that Sunday morning. And I remember so, talking yeah. about that early wave, but I don't think that ever materialized. So, yeah. Any other questions? Um, yeah, measuring wise, definitely. But depending on size of the snowflakes while they're falling, you still don't have an exact answer as if the winds really cut the dendrites apart while they're falling to the surface. But you'd have to think that stronger winds would have a role in doing that. But yeah, anyone trying to measure, good luck in those 50 mile an hour winds. Yeah, yeah you could really tell just by looking yeah. at that time lapse video you showed as the snow drifts were accumulating up, the table surface was completely mm -hmm. clear. Yeah. yeah. I don't know where that dic that one snow report out in the caliber or wherever it was the eight to ten inch, really. Uh, yeah, I mean, I <laughs> in my yard you have areas of snow of five inches, and then right other places you had thirty six inches. Right. So yeah, it's, just had to find somewhere where it was not really affected by drifting yeah. as much, and which is still drifting. difficult. But yeah, can you go back to like one of the earlier slides with the uh, the GFS from NSEP? Probably near the beginning. Yeah, right near the beginning. Keep going. Keep going. Keep that going. One. No, next. That's the, the first. I think you meant. The yeah, the, yeah. I'm sorry. You're right. Keep Before going. That. Keep going. 
No, the next one after that. That one. There you go. Interesting thing about this pattern is this is not that unlike this year. No. This year it's centered a little further westward, I would say. At least this ridging is. But you're still, I mean, we have a situation in the models for this weekend and next week where you have uh, a wave coming down and cutting off down the Four Corners region and you have another northern stream wave that's going to come down and the big question will be whether they phase or not to create another, or the first winter storm of the year for this winter, so. Pretty cool. Any questions, concerns? <laughs> How many of you guys got uh, lightning? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we had that event forecasted really well. I sent out an email to COD on Sunday saying this is a multi-school yeah. closing day right. or you know, multi-days of closing. Right. And uh, that morning, the only thing that the only thing the models were off at is that it started earlier than it was forecast to. Yes, in Mezzo yeah. that night before we were thinking what six o'clock. Yeah, yeah six o'clock. We closed down the next day at two. Two. Yeah, and then it started right at two. And so. it, it made once you saw it in yeah. Missouri. We so we had a meeting with the uh, vice presidents here at about. Uh, well, we were supposed to have a meeting at two to discuss closing the school mm -hmm. yeah. at six, and I. First thing in the morning, I'm looking at where it is. I'm like, we need to meet before then. So we met at noon, and I said, you know, we need to get this place closed by, I think, 2 o'clock. Yeah, 2 o'clock, yeah. And uh, Tom Glazer asked, is this one of those things where you're going to forecast this and we're only going to get 3 to 5? And I said, <laughs> worst case scenario, it's still over a foot. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because that dry slot was amazing. And the way it filled in yeah. you had that with convective instability. Oh, my gosh. Our cover page. I mean, this is IR image taken around the dry slot, and if you hit a loop of this, you would just see this area filling in as the upper low closes up over the area. These middle heights just tank, and you can just, just looking on radar, it was so convective in nature. Thunder, snow all over the place. Yep. <laughs> it did. It did. It had that warm advection yeah. for a while, and then some deformation bands, then the convection, and then the back lash, yeah. and then that lake. Man, it was really right. cool. And unfortunately, I had no clue what was going on because I lost what power at 6:45 that evening. So I was—I had nothing. Just, which is okay. You should have driven to the weather lab. All right? Huh? Yeah, you should have driven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. The roads were not much traffic on. No, them. I, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I remember that night I was trying to drive on 3:55 at about 9 p.m. and there was literally like six to eight inches in the middle of the road, like uh. everywhere. It was, you couldn't go. It was, yeah. I had to just go like 20 miles an hour the entire way home. They didn't Jeez. plow our street till like 11 a.m. the next morning. So yeah. we had three feet of snow at the end of our driveway. Okay. <laughs> and the ratios were actually a little higher um, between oh. 18 and 20. Really? Oh, OK. That makes more sense. One other unusual thing, the evening that it's the day it started, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, I went out with a snow stick, and the boards were useless. They were covered and everything else. And with the winds, the uh, the snow measurement was just fluctuating like two or three inches. Mm -hmm. You know, right? Just just looking at it, just the, the snow depth was just just constant fluctuating because of the strong winds blowing the snow. I've never seen anything like that uh, before. Yeah, I, I got to imagine for an observer that day, that must have been just a nightmare to try to. Oh, you the, know. the next day was even better because I had to take a snow core, which is the measurement of the content of water in the snow depth. And I went out with a, uh, the cylinder, which is two feet tall, not even thinking about it. He had to walk in all the snow, lower the cylinder, and just got lost in the. Wow. <laughs> so I had to get a shovel and dig that out. <laughs> it's like, like a torpedo went right down. <laughs> wow. The storm definitely blew away the 67 storm wind wise, even though it's got oh, yeah. us by a few inches. Right. It's it definitely made it much more noteworthy yeah. with the wind. We could have had two more inches, and it wouldn't have really noticed at that point. So. So that was our dream storm, and hopefully we'll see one again soon. But yeah, I wouldn't count on it. Something I'd like you guys to do, just as future work on this one, is this is where you really want to take a look at some of the isentropic analysis, and you can see the the angle of ascent mm -hmm. on some of that stuff. Right. 
Um, I would also, on some of your surface maps, I would have definitely think there's it's a more complex surface frontal features. Right. Yeah. I just try to do a general thing. You know, I, I, I didn't even do you know isotherms or iso or isodrosotherms or anything just to kind of show you know the pressure gradient and everything. But yeah, it's there was definitely more going on than what was yeah, shown I mean, there. Yeah. Earlier in the day, people were talking possible gravity waves and stuff like that. What were the piwats coming up? You remember? Uh, I don't know. I don't have to look. Yeah. I mean, the moisture feed up into this was crazy. Tense. And, and I think that was one thing that we were concerned about there was the amount of storms. Big squall line all right. the way marching right. eastward. And, and sometimes that could choke off the moisture for up here, and we completely get happen. screwed. So, You know, for a well forecasted event, we certainly questioned everything. Oh, yeah. We were just looking for ways. Oh, it's oh, yeah. going to screw up. Oh, the thunderstorms are going to suck in the moisture, and we're not yeah. going to get this. Yep. But. And actually, if it's 18 to 1 ratios, yeah. it probably was a little bit less QPF. So imagine that you actually had, didn't have those thunderstorms. Yeah. When I went into uh, the weather service with Gino, and actually Paul Merzlach was there too, that Sunday night, Paul and Gino were just joking around, and Paul said that this was the most impressive snow setup he's seen since 79. So that got me pretty excited. But they, were, they knew it was coming, and they just were looking for something to go wrong. And I remember Gino was looking at dry slot locations on several model runs trying to see if anything bad could go wrong to throw off the forecasted snowfall amounts. But that did not happen, luckily. I think the only thing that, was, that went wrong was, I think we were saying Kankakee would be the heaviest hit, and it was just a little bit north. Right. And again, my, most of it was near the lake, too. So the lake had some sort of you know, enhancement with that, which is surprising. But. And did you, did, did you get lightning? How many times are we going to go over this? <laughs> I was in my garage all night and I didn't see a flash. All right. All right, guys. Thanks again. Yes.